Hello, and welcome to our first lecture of CHY 113 for the fall semester. Today we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the essential ideas in chemistry. Uh, some of the, the reasons really kind of why you're here uh, and why you might be taking a course such as chemistry, even if you are not a chemistry major. Uh, and so I really like this slide that I always start with when, when I begin this lecture because it really shows me the, the reason, uh, again, why we're here, why chemistry is so important. As you can see from, from looking at this, we've got all these sciences, different aspects of medicine, biology, food science, environmental, math, nuclear science, chemical engineering, physics. We've, we've got all these different sciences. And look at what's right in the middle of everything. Chemistry is, is at the heart of, of, of really all of science. Uh, it's often called the central science for that reason. And, and it's really what drew me to chemistry to begin with. Uh, my, my background is, is that I actually bounced around a little bit with, with varying careers. I actually got my initial bachelor's degree in psychology and entered the business world for a little while. Really wasn't loving that. Uh, and so I ended up going back to school for environmental science. And through the course of that environmental science degree, I started taking a lot of chemistry. And I realized that, like I said, that chemistry really was, was at the center of everything it was that I was studying. And, and it really drew me in. And, and so I ended up going to graduate school for chemistry in particular. Um, but for instance, if you're, if you're a biology major, if you're studying things in biology, you can't understand some of the, the very tenets of, of biology, things like photosynthesis and cellular respiration and cell structures and some of the very basics of biology without understanding the underlying chemistry. And, and, and so chemistry really is, is, is in the middle of, of, of everything. And so that's one of the big reasons that a lot of you are taking a course like this, because you're in a discipline, you're in a field that requires you to have some baseline understanding of chemistry, some, some baseline understanding of matter and, and how it behaves. Uh, and, and so that's really at the, at the heart, at the base of what we're going to be looking at in this class. And so just a few things that, that we will be looking at, sorry, in this lecture, we'll be looking at chemistry a little bit in general, how we classify matter, looking at the difference between elements and compounds, and then looking at, at some various physical and chemical properties and changes, and then a very little bit about energy. Um, so just sort of laying a bit of a foundation for some of the things that we're going to be studying later in the semester. I, I typically don't talk much about the scientific method in a course like this. At this point, you, you've all probably been beat over the head to death with the scientific method in your high school science classes. You, you may have looked at it even in some of your college courses. We're certainly going to to be using it and we'll be using the scientific method a lot in lab, those of you that are in 114. Um, but I always do like to at least discuss the story of Alexander Fleming because for me, it really, it really just shows how science works and it shows the process behind everything and the mindset that a good scientist must have. Uh, and so in the 20s, Fleming was a scientist who was working with bacteria. And this shows a pretty common Petri dish uh, of, full of bacterial cultures. You can see all these little spots here are our various cultures of bacteria. And, and this is where we get to, you know, who knows how much of this is myth and, and legend and how much of it is true. But the story always goes that Fleming was kind of a slob and, and, and didn't really take care of things and pick up after himself. And so he went away on vacation and he left one of his bacterial plates just sort of sitting out. And when he returned, he found that the, that dish of bacteria was contaminated with some blue mold. And further, what he found is that bacteria didn't grow in the vicinity of the mold. So here's the mold right here. And we can see that in this region, in this zone around the mold, there's a lot less bacteria. There's not much bacteria at all. Now here's where the, the work of Fleming really takes off. And here's where it shows that he was a scientist at heart, is that a lot of people might have seen something like this, might have seen mold in their experiment and said, oh, well, that's ruined. 
tossed it out and and went on and, and made uh, a new bacterial plate. Fleming didn't do that. What Fleming did is he said, huh, well, that's kind of weird. Why isn't there bacteria growing around here? He made an observation and, and he said, okay, th this is happening. He went further to then say, well, why? Why does this happen? And that, that sort of curiosity, that, that drive to understand things that you see, that drive to understand these sorts of observations really is what sets scientists apart. That, that's what drives scientific inquiry, is that desire to know things, that desire to find an answer to a question like this. And so Fleming threw a guess out there. He, so he had this observation that, that bacteria was not growing near the mold. And so he guessed that the mold was probably giving something off that was deadly to the bacteria. And so he designed some, some experiments, a series of experiments to test this guess. And he discovered he was absolutely right, that the, the bacteria was, or sorry, that the mold was definitely giving something off that killed the bacteria. And then he told the world, told everybody all about it. He said, I, I've, I've had this amazing discovery, mold gives something off that is deadly to bacteria. Take a second, think about this. Does, does anyone know what he might have discovered? So I insert the Jeopardy theme song here. Do, do, sorry. Bec uh, penicillin. This was the discovery of penicillin. Literally by accident, because somebody accidentally grew mold in their lab, saw that it killed bacteria, and went to discover why. And so the scientific method starts with an observation. In, in Fleming's case, it was that observation that there's very little bacteria growing around this mold. From there, we have a hypothesis. We have something for a guess that explains the observation. Now, it's important to note that a hypothesis is much more than just throwing a guess out there. It's much more than, than just this random hunch. It is an educated guess, for one thing, which is based on prior knowledge. For another, it has to be testable. In order for it to be a valid scientific hypothesis, you have to be able to test for it. You have to be able to design a set of experiments that are going to help you answer that question or, uh, and, and help you explain that observation. And then the experiment comes in. We set up control versus experimental groups. Uh, I'm sure Fleming went through many, many, many different dishes of, of many different groups. Um, but for just a, a, an example of a very simple one, he might have had one Petri dish that he was growing bacteria in that had no mold in it, another bacteria or another dish that did have mold in it, and, and really looking to now quantify the differences there and, 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 and what's going on between the two set, sets of plates. And then analysis and interpretation of the data. This oftentimes is where the real work sets in. When I was in graduate school, there would be many, many times when I might spend a day actually performing experiments and then you spend the rest of the week analyzing it, spend, spend, the rest, spend that time poring over Excel spreadsheets and talking with, with other people, talking with, with fellow scientists, people that work with you, talking with, in the case of myself in graduate school, talking with your advisor and saying, okay, what do we think is going on here? And then another set of experiments and, and on and on, and the cycle goes on until eventually you reach a point where you can publish it. In today's scientific atmosphere, that means publishing in peer-reviewed peer journals. Um, just imagine if Fleming had discovered what he had discovered, he didn't tell anyone. Uh, I, I mean, penicillin, I'm sure, would have eventually been discovered in another way, and somebody would have let the world know. But because Fleming was able to discover it when he did in the late 20s, think about how many people were saved in World War, oh, and I'm awful with my history, I think World War I was probably just ending around that time. Somebody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but certainly World War II. Uh, and think about how many soldiers would have died in World War II or in Korea or in Vietnam if we hadn't had penicillin. And, and not just warfare. Think about the general citizenship. Uh, and, and so it, it's just so key. And it's such a key part of the scientific process is to publish your data. Let the world know about it. And so that's science, that, that's the scientific method. Uh, 
And like I said, I just, I really love that story of Fleming because it just, it illustrates that whole process and illustrates the mind of a scientist so beautifully for us. And so basic chemistry, basic science and its methods, we have a hypothesis, like we talked about, a tentative explanation or prediction that is based on some observations. We might be able to eventually work into a scientific law, which is a, either a verbal or even a mathematical statement of behavior. Think of things like the um, like gravitational law, where we have the, an actual equation which defines the, the attraction between two different masses. Uh, or possibly a theory, uh, a well-tested unifying principle explaining a body of facts. So something like cell theory or germ theory, things like that, that really have, have reached such a point in science that it's pretty much agreed on by the vast majority of scientists that this theory, this, this unifying principle, explains this set of observations. Uh, and so that's an, it's another example, or it's an example of how a term in science really is quite different from how a term might be used in everyday usage. When we use the term theory in science, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's set in stone, but it, it almost is. It, it's, we, we have this, this set of, um, this idea that really sort of explains all these different facts and the vast, vast, vast majority of, of scientists out there would agree that yes, th this idea explains these things. Whereas a theory in sort of everyday usage, uh, you know, as, as the semester goes on, some of you might say, well, I've got a theory that Mr. Staples is so hard and I can never pass his test because he's bald and he's a jerk. And so that's more of just sort of okay, I, I, I've got this, this hunch, this guess, and I've got this theory about something. Uh, and, and so very, very, very different usages of the term between everyday usage and what it really means in science. Uh, and so that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward through the semester as well. Uh, and just for your, your general knowledge, um, you know, just the, the differences there. And so what is chemistry? So, so why are we here? What, what, are we, what are we really studying? Chemistry at, at, at its heart, and, and the definition of chemistry is that it is the study of matter and the transformations that matter can undergo. Now, we're, we're going to look at that in a lot of detail. We're going to start the semester off by really looking at, at the very nature of, of matter itself and the building blocks of matter. Then, then we're going to move on to, to really look at some of the, the different transformations in chemical reactions and look at the energy that's involved in, in some of these reactions and processes. Um, but really at its base, that's what chemistry is. Matter and how matter can transform. And so we have to define matter. Matter is absolutely anything that occupies space and has mass. If it has mass and it takes up space, it is matter. And so some things are pretty obvious. I mean, my, my Apple pencil here obviously matter. I mean, this has mass. It definitely has a volume. My nice little post-it notes with my lab notes. Get it? Okay, that's a combination dad joke and science joke. But again, obviously matter. Each one of these sheets has mass and it takes up space. The air down here in my little basement man cave office, that's matter. Uh, you know, if we, if we blow up a balloon with air, that has mass and it takes up space. We can't see it but it's absolutely matter. Something like energy, on the other hand, and heat. Now we start getting into something that's different uh, and, and something that we're not going to get into too much detail on in this course, uh, but it's nice to touch on it, is that matter and energy are really kind of two sides of the same coin. And really, that's sort of what Einstein's famous equation was all about. When we look at Einstein's equation, and everyone's probably at least familiar with it, but the old famous E equals MC squared. C here is just the speed of light, which we don't really have to worry about as far as the, what I'm demonstrating here. M is mass, and E is energy. 
and really the only reason that that I point this out and that I um, that I bring this up is just to show that that relationship between energy and mass, energy and matter. Uh, and, and really, we can sort of think of them as, as two sides of the same coin. And we'll, we will talk a little bit more about this later on. So they're related, but, but they're not the same thing. And so we've talked about mass. Uh, and so mass in general is just a measure of the amount of matter that an object contains. Now, we do have to differentiate between mass and weight, because mass and weight are definitely different things from each other. And so mass, like we just mentioned, said in, uh, on the slide, is the amount of matter that is actually contained within an object. That is different from weight, which is a measure of the gravitational pull on that mass. And so those are going to be different things. You'll find that, that we tend to use the term interchange, the terms interchangeably, mass and weight, especially in lab. You're, you're going to see that all the time. Go get the mass of this object. Go get the weight of this object. And, and so we do use the terms interchangeably, just sort of in conversation. But understand that they are different things. And really, the reason that we use them interchangeably is because all of the all of the science that we do, at least you know, in this course and on this university, takes place on Earth, and, and so the measure of gravitational pull is is going to be the same. Uh, and so, but if we took, for instance, if we have something that is a hundred kilogram object and we take that to, or, or we take the mass of that here on earth, we're going to find a certain mass of, you know, it's gonna weigh a certain amount. Maybe we'll, we'll think about weight in pounds. It's gonna weigh a certain amount of pounds. Okay, remember when I said I'd pause the recording once in a while? Well, I just did it here so I could check a couple of figures before we moved on. And so, again, let's say we have something, we have a hundred kilogram object and we take the weight of that. The weight of that here on Earth, if we do a conversion, the weight of that is going to equal roughly 220 pounds. So that's going to be here on Earth. Now we take that same object to the moon. The amount of matter hasn't changed. We haven't changed how much matter is in this object. And so the amount of matter there is still going to be 100 kilograms. But now, if we take the weight of it, that same object is going to weigh roughly 36 pounds on the moon. And so there's our difference. The, the amount of matter, the mass, has not changed between here and the moon for this object, but the weight of it certainly has. The moon is a lot smaller than the Earth, and so there's a lot less of a gravitational pull. And so that is matter and mass. And so as scientists, we love to classify things. We, we like to be able to put things into, into different groups. And so in chemistry, we or for matter, we will classify things in a few different ways. One of the ways is that we'll classify things just simply according to their physical state. And so we'll classify things as either a gas, a liquid, or a solid. We'll also classify things according to their composition, according to how they are made up. And so is it a purely elemental substance made up of just one thing from the periodic table? Is it a compound made up of more than one thing from the table? Or is it maybe a mixture of, of different compounds, different elements in there? And, and so we'll talk about these classifications. So first, classifying according to states of matter. Again, we're, we're all familiar with solids, liquids, and gases the three basic most common forms of matter here on Earth. Be aware that there are other forms of matter that, that you might encounter. Um, things like Bo Bose-Einstein condensates, 
uh, and then plasma. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not real familiar, at least with uh, Bose-Einstein condescents, uh, but they are just different forms that matter can take. Uh, and so we have a solid, and so and these are these are pretty familiar to me. At least looking at them at a macro level, you guys know the difference between solids, gases, and liquids. You, you just do. So here we have some bromine. We have solid chunks of it here floating in a little bit of liquid bromine. Or we have the, some bromine here in the in, in our flask. We have some liquid bromine here at the bottom, and we can see the gaseous bromine up here in the top. One of the things that we want to be able to think about in this class though is not only what things look like on this, this macroscopic level, but we want to look at and think about what things look like on a molecular level as well. And so what do things look like if we were to, to look at them at the individual molecules? And so let's take a look at that here. We have this demonstration, switch it to water. So here's some water molecules at a very, very cold temperature, 146 Kelvin. We'll, we'll talk more about the Kelvin scale later on in the semester, but know that 146 Kelvin is actually negative 127 degrees Celsius. So we're, we're pretty cold here. And so this is water. And so obviously at, at negative 127, we're in the solid form. And so if we were to actually observe this, if this were something that, that, that we were looking at, this would be just an ice cube. This, this would be an ice cube that you're pulling out from your freezer. One thing that I want you to note is the motion here. Even in the solid phase, molecules are still always moving. There's still energy there. They, they, are, they are vibrating around, they are in motion. But what happens is the forces that are holding them together, which are forces we'll talk about in a lot more detail towards the end of the semester, but these forces that hold the molecules together are, pr are pretty much static. This water molecule here is always attached to this one, to this one, and to this one, and that's not changing. And, and you can see that wherever you look, that, that everything's pretty much locked in. They're in motion, they're vibrating, they're moving around, but all the molecules are, are, are locked to each other in, in a way that's not changing. And so when we start to heat things up though, actually, let me, let me back off a little bit. If we cool down even further, if we start really cooling down, start really getting down there. Now we're getting very, 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 very cold. And I don't even know if this demonstration will let me bring it down to, to the level that I want to. And it lets me get down to one, Calvin. Let's see if it lets me get to zero. Am I drop down to it? No, it lets me get down to one and that's it. So this is one Kelvin above a temperature that we call absolute zero. Absolute zero is at zero Kelvin. At absolute zero, all motion completely stops. All of it. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this again later on in the semester when we start really looking at the effects of temperature on, on matter and, and some of the relationships there. Um, but you can see even at one Kelvin, just one Kelvin above absolute zero, there's still a little motion there. The thing, things are still moving a little bit. But now we start to warm things back up. We start to get some motion in there. Now we're getting up there. Once we get to 270, I passed it. Let's see if I can bring it back down. There, 273 Kelvin. Here we're at the freezing point or the melting point of water. And so if we were to go, again, if we we're looking at an ice cube, if we, were to go, if we were to go above this at all, we're gonna start to melt. Below this at all, if we are already liquid, we go below this, we're, we're going to start to freeze. And so you can see what the difference is, is that we're starting to get more energetic. And our molecules are starting to move around even more. So we start to heat up even more. We'll just jump ahead a little bit. And we get into a, a pure, actually, we get to a liquid state. And we can see that the molecules have a lot more energy. They're, they're moving around quite a bit. 
and we can see that they're not all necessarily, especially those sort of here at the surface, there's some, some movement. They're not all necessarily staying connected to the same ones in the same way that they did as, uh, as a solid. And if we start heating it up even more, we, we can see even more of that difference and, and more of that motion. That's what gives a liquid the properties that it does. And we'll, we'll talk about those properties in a minute. But it is that ability to, of the molecules to move and to slide around from each other. And notice that some of them even have enough energy to escape. And those would be in, in the vapor phase. Then we start heating up even more and even more and even more. Now, now we're in the gas phase. Now these molecules are gaseous. We're going to jump ahead even more with our temperature. Here, is some, here are some molecules at 430 Kelvin, which would be a temperature in Celsius of about 160 degrees C. Sorry if things jumped around a little bit there and, and maybe the, the screen changed a little. Um, but so we're pretty hot. We're at 160 degrees Celsius. It's pretty hot now. Uh, and we can see that the, that the molecules are all moving around and, and they're really not connected to each other at all anymore. And, and the only interaction they have is when they bounce into each other. Furthermore, we can see that, that really, and we can see it even more if we heat this up even more, that the molecules are all over the place and taking up the, the space of this entire container. And so that's another difference, another property of gases, is that they're going to take up their whole entire container. So let's come back. And so if we look at some of the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. So solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. Let's come back here. So here's our ice cube, or you know, my, my apple pencil. No matter what I do to this temperature-wise, if, if I start to warm this up, if I put this in, in a hot room or a cold room, it, it's going to stay this shape. It's going to stay this volume. If I put it into a container, if I was to take my Apple Pencil and put it into my water bottle here, the shape and the volume of this is not going to change dependent on its container. And the, and the molecules have the lowest kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Liquids have what we call an indefinite shape and a definite volume. So again, let's look at things on the molecular level. So liquids will have a definite volume. If I take, uh, um, you know, like a cup of water, and I were to pour it into, into this bottle, then the shape of that is going to change. The, the water is now going to take the shape of my water bottle compared to the shape of the cup that it was in before. But that volume, that cup, isn't going to change. It's going to be that same volume of water. And we can see that we have an in, uh, in deter, or sorry, a, um, in intermediate, this is the word I was trying to think of, kinetic energy, sort of in the middle. But then we get it up even more to our gas phase. Right? We have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. Gases are going to take the shape and volume of the container that they're in. And so we have our gas phase here, and you can see that. The, the gases are all over the place in the whole entire bottle, or the whole entire container here, taking up the, the volume of the whole thing and taking the shape of the whole thing. And, and so a gas will always completely fill the container that it's in. And so that's why if we're, if we're talking about gases, or if you're buying a, something in, in a gas form, it's useless to think about it in terms of the volume of the gas. It doesn't tell you how much is actually there. You've got to think about the mass of when you're talking about a gas, how much of the actual matter is there. Uh, because volume-wise, it's always going to take up the complete volume of its container. So those are basics on solids, liquids, and gases. Um, like I said, there are the, the other phases of matter. Plasma is, is, the, is the other one that you might encounter a little bit. Um, plasma, when we start talking about the um, atomic structure and, and how an atom is, is, is made up, um, we'll just mention it briefly here, but we have our nucleus in the, in the center with our protons and our neutrons and our electrons all around on the outside. And plasma is a state that is such high energy that really the electrons have sort of been knocked away 
and, and the electrons then are sort of free flowing throughout the whole entire thing. And, and so individual atoms don't necessarily retain ownership, so to speak, of their electrons anymore because there's just so much energy in there. For instance, the sun, most of the matter in the sun is in the plasma state. There, there's just so much energy that, that the individual hydrogen and helium atoms in the sun don't retain ownership of their own electrons. The, those electrons are sort of free flowing throughout the whole thing. We're not really going to, enc going to encounter pl plasma here. We're looking at solids, liquids, and gases for the most part. So we also classify matter according to its composition, according to how is the matter actually made up. And so, sorry, getting used to my mouse again. And so matter in general, so we, we said that is anything that occupies space and has mass, we can, we can break that down into mixtures or pure substances. Let's look first at a pure substance. A pure substance is something that, that is going to have a fixed composition and by and large cannot be further purified using simple means. Pure substances will break down even further into the purest of the pure, so to speak, elements. And so an elemental substance is something that, that is made up of only one type of atom. If, I have, if I'm lucky enough to be holding onto a pure gold bar, the only type of atom in that bar is a gold atom. And that's it, just gold. As opposed to another, the other type of pure substance, a compound. Now we have two or more elements that are coming together in fixed ratios. One of the key hallmarks of a compound is that a compound is going to be identified by its chemical formula. So the most easily recognizable, probably water, H2O, so water is a compound made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And so if we were to look at what that actually looks like, a water molecule is going to look sort of like that with our one oxygen and our two hydrogens on it. Or we could have something like glucose, C6H12O6 made up of two or more elements, but always found in this, this pure ratio, this, this, this ratio of six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. And that would make up a glucose molecule. So then we also have, we also have our mixtures. More than one pure substance present. And I'll actually see some examples of mixtures a little bit more in, in, in a couple slides. So like I said, elements, elemental, cannot be converted uh, into simpler forms by, by an easy chemical reaction. And so things like sodium, helium, and I mentioned gold, you know, anything that, that if you can find it on the periodic table, that's something in its elemental form. Compounds, combination of two or more elements in some sort of definitive ratio. And here's just a few examples. You know, we can see some, some mercury here, pure mercury in this liquid form, some pure powdered sulfur, copper wire used, used in, um, for running electricity, pure iron, pure aluminum, and, and so on. Uh, and these elements are all found on the periodic table. And at this time, there are 118 known elements. And we'll talk a lot more about the periodic deep table in a lot of detail uh, in chapter two. Then we have our compounds. And so for instance, if we were to take some pure sodium and some pure chlorine, mix those together to make a compound, we're going to get sodium chloride, NaCl, common table salt. So that now is a chemical compound. We have a mixture of two or more types of elements. And so now mixtures. So we, mixtures are two or more pure substances coming together. We have two primary types of mixtures. We have either a homogeneous mixture, which will have a uniform composition, or a heterogeneous mixture, which will have a non-uniform composition. So that's maybe easiest. Actually, we'll, well, yeah, so here's, here's an example. 
uh, of, of a way to sort of differentiate them as well is that a, a heterogeneous mixture can quite often be easily separated by filtration. So here we have a heterogeneous mixture of just soil and water. And we're going to go ahead and pour that through filter paper. The soil is going to be caught here and trapped by the filter paper and the water will drop through. So the fact that, that these things can be easily separated by filtration shows that we're starting out with a heterogeneous mixture. Sometimes you can just see it pretty easily too. And, and I, I've, I've always liked this slide. I've used this slide for, since I started teaching chemistry over a decade ago. And, and we can really easily see the difference between things using a, an example that everyone's familiar with. But here we have a glass of pure water. So pure substance, it's a compound. The only thing, assuming this is just nothing but pure water, the only thing in here is H2O. That's all you're gonna find in this, in this glass. Now we have some lemonade from a powdered mix. So we put just a little bit of our mix into, into our water, stirred it together. And now what we have is a nice uniform mixture. So we, we don't see differences in here. We can't filter this. If you put this through some filter paper, it's all gonna come through just as is. So we have a homogeneous mixture. And now we have some lemonade from fresh squeezed lemons. And we can see all these little pulp floaties floating around in there. Now we have a heterogeneous mixture. Now, now we have something that's not all completely uniform. We can see definite differences in there. And so that is a heterogeneous mixture. You could filter this. You, you could pass this through some filter paper, catch all the pulp, and then get just the lemonade out from that. Mixtures can be separated in different ways too, besides just filtration. Uh, or even if you, sorry, if you have homogeneous mixtures, you might be able to separate them by some of their physical properties as well. You might be able to, if you have two different things that with different densities, okay, you may be able to use something we call decantation or, or put them in a centrifuge. Distillation, by, we can separate things by boiling point. And so that, that's actually a technique that those of you that go on to organic chemistry that you will use to purify things quite often. They states of matter, we can separate by filtration and so on. So some various ways that we can separate mixtures by physical means, by taking advantage of their physical properties. Chemical compounds, like I mentioned, are, are all made up of two or more elements or, uh, or different ions. We'll talk more about ions later on. And just some of the terminology that, that we have to work with. So a compound is, is going to be sort of the, the overarching term for this thing. And so water, for instance, is a compound. We, re we refer to water as a compound. We refer to sodium chloride as a compound. Glucose is a compound. That, that's just how we classify it. A molecule is the smallest unit of that compound which retains its chemical characteristics. And so for instance, when we, if we look back at our states of matter, each of these that we can see floating around here, these are individual water molecules. And so water in general is classified as a compound, but each of these individual units here are individual water molecules. Things that are ionic compounds, we describe by what we call a formula unit whereas covalent compounds or molecules are described by a molecular formula. And we'll talk more about those differences when we start talking about ionic versus covalent in a, in a few weeks. And it's just sort of worth bringing up now that, that there are some differences in terminology there that we're going to be dealing with. And so different compounds, different elements have varying physical properties. And, and so these are properties that we can evaluate, that we can check out without actually changing the composition of the material, without, without altering the material in some way. We can measure the, the color. We can observe the color of something without fundamentally changing it. We can measure the density of something without changing it in some way. We just measure the mass, we measure the volume, we divide, we calculate our density. We can measure the melting point of something. If we take a, a sample of aluminum and we melt that, we can find out what, the, what temperature that occurs at and find our melting point but that doesn't change what we have. We still have aluminum. We, we just go from solid aluminum to liquid aluminum. 
and, and so we're not changing what it is. And so just various, uh, various different physical properties that we can see here. We do divide physical properties into two different categories. Extensive properties depend on the amount of the substance we have. So something like mass is a physical property. If we have a sample of, of some, uh, some compound or some element and it has a certain mass, that is a physical property of that particular sample. But that's a property that's going to change depending on how much of it we have. The more of that substance we have, the more mass it has. An intensive property, however, something like density, doesn't change no matter how much of it you actually have. If you have a tiny little thimbleful of water, its density is approximately one gram per milliliter. Every milliliter of that water is going to weigh one gram or have a mass of one gram. If you have an entire tub full of water, the density of that tub full is one gram per milliliter. Every milliliter of that will have a mass of one gram. Um, boiling point, freezing point, all those sorts of states of matter properties are intensive properties. So we, if we have that same thimbleful of water, it is going to start to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. If we have that same tub full of water, it is going to start to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature at which that happens is not going to change no matter how much of the substance you have. What's changing is the amount of energy required to raise it to that temperature. And that's something that we're going to be delving into a lot in a few weeks when we start looking at the energy involved in chemical transformations but the actual temperature that occurs at will not change. Try this at home, if, if you don't believe me. Uh, take, a, take a pot of water, fill it up, quarter, half full or so, measure the temperature at which that starts to boil. It should be right around 100 degrees Celsius. And then take a much larger pot of water, fill, fill up one of your, fill up a big stock pot of water, throw that on the stove it's going to start to boil at about 100 degrees Celsius. Your difference, assuming you, you put the, you're using the same burner, put it up on high, the difference is going to be the amount of time that it takes to get to that temperature because the amount of energy in that big stock pod that we need for that big stock pod is a lot more than we need for the smaller pot. But the temperature itself does not change. That means that that is an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much of it we have, that property does not change. Physical properties in general are a function of what we call intermolecular forces. These are something we're going to be talking a lot about towards the end of the course. But intermolecular forces are, are just the forces of attraction that hold molecules together. Something like methane has a much weaker intermolecular force than water. And so it's easier to pull methane molecules apart. Therefore, things like its boiling point is going to be a lot lower than something like water. And so that's why methane is a gas at 25 degrees C. There's enough energy at 25 degrees to, to separate the molecules from each other completely. But water is going to be a liquid at 25 degrees C because there's not enough energy to now to separate the water molecules because there's a greater force of attraction. Even though they're roughly the same size, sorry, roughly the same, uh, the same weight per molecule. Uh, physical properties are affected by temperature. You can see that a little bit here. If we have the density of water, we can see that the density does change slightly at various temperatures. That's just something to keep in mind a little bit. We're not going to, to uh, it's not something that we're going to encounter a lot in this course, but that is just something to keep in mind that, that these physical properties we talk about are affected by temperature because temperature really is just a measure of the molecular motion of particles. Really not used to all this talking. Wow, okay. Chemical properties, on the other hand, in order to measure a chemical property of some sort, we have to actually change the composition of the material. Because chemical properties, what they do really is they explain how a substance reacts or behaves in the presence of another substance. And so in order for that to occur, we need to send the substance through a chemical reaction. And so for example, one of the chemical properties of wood is that it has an ability to burn, which we call combustion. And so in order to observe that, in order to know that, sorry, I'll wait for that to disappear, go away. Yep. 
It will. So in order to, to really know that, we have to, uh, sorry, it's just one of the things that I, that I hate about sort of using Google Sheets. But anyway, so in order to know that, in order to see that something does burn, in order to see that it combusts, we have to burn it. And, and in doing so, you can see here that we produce new things. We, we produce some carbon dioxide, water, and heat. So the reactants and the products are different from each other. We, we've sent this through a chemical reaction. But that's the only way we're going to know if something combusts or not, is to combust it, it is to burn it. And so to observe a chemical property, we, we have to actually see that change. We have, we have to send it through a chemical reaction. And so chemical properties in general really are chemical changes. And so for instance, here we have some, uh, some oxygen, just gas floating around the room or in the, in the surroundings here. And we have some hydrogen gas touch a flame to it, make the reaction occur, boom, now we made water. And so that's one of the chemical properties of hydrogen gas is that it is flammable. It will combust with oxygen. And in doing so, it will produce water. It will produce some water molecules. So we talked about uh, well, what a molecule is, that a molecule is the smallest unit of a compound that still retains the chemical characteristics of that compound. And the composition of a molecule is given by a molecular formula. So again, if we come over here, we can see a couple examples of molecular formulas. So we have, for instance, our molecular formula for water. Our molecular formula is H2O, two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom. Our molecular formula for glucose, C6H12O6. And so it describes the composition, the molecular formula describes the composition of that molecule. What, what is the ratio of different atoms within that molecule? And just some other examples. We see some water, we see methane, CH4, ammonia, NH3, carbon dioxide, CO2. And again, here we have all different molecular formulas which give us our, our elements and our ratios of our various molecules. Let's talk briefly about physical versus chemical changes. In a physical change, we don't actually change the composition of a substance. And so for instance, if we take some solid iron and we melt that in a blast furnace, here we have solid iron, now we've melted it, and we have liquid iron. We still have iron. We, we haven't changed what we, the actual composition of the substance that we have. If you take an ice cube, leave it out on the counter, you're going to go from having a solid ice cube to now having a puddle of water with liquid water. But it's still H2O. It hasn't changed the actual substance. If you go even further and now vaporize the water, raise the temperature even more, get it to H2O gas, it's still H2O. It hasn't actually changed what it is. And so that's the hallmark of a physical change is that we are not changing the actual substance that we have. That's different from a chemical change. In a chemical change, we are forming something new that we didn't have before. And so for instance, if we take that same iron, that same solid iron, and now we leave it outside for long enough, we let it react with oxygen in the atmosphere, we're going to form this new compound called iron two oxide. That's rust. And so we formed something completely new. This iron two oxide did not exist before. It was formed as a result of our chemical change. We saw a minute ago the hydrogen and oxygen reacting to form water. So again, we have H2, we have O2. Those are now, we have pure hydrogen, we have pure oxygen. We react them together and we form water. Statue of Liberty. When the Statue of Liberty actually came to us, it was, yeah, well, it is, it, it is copper. The Statue of Liberty is made out of copper. And so when it came to us, it looked like what you expect copper to see, sort of that, that shiny brown. Over time, however, that copper reacted with air, it oxidized in air to form this copper to oxide, which, which forms as a layer on the outside, and that's a green color. So now the Statue of Liberty appears green because it has a layer 
of copper two oxide. That's a compound that wasn't there before. It, it's something that changed. Sorry, one more example that, that I just really love. Uh, actually, let me bring back to bring us back to something that we looked at a minute ago. Okay, so this example of our sodium and our chlorine that we looked at a minute ago. Solid sodium metal, you, you can see it here, is very silvery, sort of whitish gray, very soft. You can cut it actually with a, with a butter knife, very soft metal. Put sodium in water, and those of you who might have, might have seen this in high school, it's probably your favorite high school chemistry day. Put the sodium in water, it's going to possibly catch on fire and blow up. The, it's, it's very explosive with water, reacts violently with water. Chlorine gas, very toxic gas, was actually one of the first gases used in chemical warfare. I believe it was World War I, where um, I think it was the Germans, but don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure the, the, that the Germans started to use it and would spread chlorine gas out across the battlefield, where it would then react with the water in the soldiers' eyes. And as it reacted with that water, it formed hydrochloric acid. And so then the soldiers went blind, hydrochloric acid in their eyes. That wasn't their biggest worry, believe it or not, because the chlorine would then actually react with the oxygen, or sorry, with the water in their lungs, form hydrochloric acid in their lungs, then destroy their lungs and they would die. Incredibly toxic, incredibly dangerous gas. And so here we have a metal that we can take and uh, throw it in water and it blows up. We have a gas, sorry. We have a gas that will kill you pretty quickly if you're breathing it in. If you react the two of them together though, now we're gonna form sodium chloride, you're gonna put it on your popcorn. You're gonna throw that on your french fries. And, and so this is one of my favorite examples of a chemical change because we've taken two substances, two fairly dangerous substances with, with their own sets of chemical and physical properties. We've reacted them together to make something with a completely new set of properties. That's the hallmark of a chemical change. We've taken two or more things, reacted them and, and, and mixed them together to form something brand new with a brand new set of properties. That's what physical change is all, or sorry, that's what chemical change is all about. Making something brand new that didn't exist before with this brand new set of properties. And so think about these examples. Think about if these are examples of chemical or physical changes. And again, really remember what you have to key in on is are these examples of new substances forming that didn't exist before? Do, do we have a new compound that we didn't have in the beginning? So pause for just a moment and, and, and think about these and what you think they might be, either chemical or physical. Think you've got it? Okay. Mulching of leaves. So, so here we're, we're taking leaves and we're just mulching them up, making them smaller. We still have the same leaves. We, we haven't actually changed the, the physical composition of them or the chemical makeup of them. So that's just a physical change. Milk turning sour, that's a chemical change. That when milk goes sour, there's a fermentation process that happens. And in that process, we form lactic acid. And that lactic acid is then responsible for curdling the milk and, 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 then, and, for, and having it go bad, so to speak. The odor of mothballs. When we smell a mothball, we're smelling a, a chemical called naphthalene. So that's just physical. Those are, those, that's that, that chemical, that naphthalene entering into our nasal passages and, and we, um, we smell the, the odor of mothballs as a result. Ice melting, still just water, it's still H2O. So that's a physical change. The very, very, very sad example of a beer going flat because it was left out for too long. All that's happening there is the carbon dioxide that was in the beer has now left, has now been released. And so we haven't changed anything. We still have the beer, 
or you know what's left in there and the carbon dioxide has now just gone away but it's still carbon dioxide and, and it's still the beer so nothing chemically no chemical makeup has changed so the only chemical change in this process is milk turning sour and the rest of these are all physical changes but we because we have not changed the actual composition Energy, we're going to touch on just real briefly in, in this sort of intro, this, this essentials of, of chemistry introduction. Energy, we can classify as either kinetic or potential. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And so think of things like, like throwing a ball, um, water falling, and anything like that. Anytime we're moving, we're, we're looking at kinetic energy. For our purposes, we'll be thinking of kinetic energy more with the energy uh, associated with the motion of particles. And we'll be speaking about that a lot more when we talk about things like temperature later on in the semester. Potential energy. So things like gravitational potential energy, like my little Apple pencil, if I hold it here, has a different potential energy than if I hold it down here. Try to keep it in the screen. Um, you know, the, there's, there's more gravitational potential energy up here than there is for it down here, for instance. We are going to look at a couple different types in this class in particular. We're going to look at, at the really the energy stored in molecules at something that, that we, we refer to as chemical energy. So things and things like the energy stored in food. And so when we have a chemical change as we move from one type of substance to another, what sorts of, sort of energy is either taken in or released as a result of that process. And so we'll be taking a peek at that later on. We're not really going to look at nuclear energy much in this course. That's another type of potential energy, the energy that is sort of inherent in, in an atom. If you bust an atom apart, that is going to release some energy. And, and so there is some potential energy inherent in the atom, which can be released upon it coming apart in the process of fission or the energy, for instance, of two hydrogen atoms in the sun as they fuse together to form helium. That's the process of fusion. And in that process, that releases energy as well. And so there's potential energy in those two hydrogen atoms before they come together and fuse into helium. And so that is all for today. Those are some of the, the essentials of chemistry that will form some of the backbone of things that we talk about later. And for the next lecture, we are going to talk a lot about the math associated with chemistry. Uh, and so in these first couple lectures, we're, we're really kind of getting some of our tools out of the way that we're going to have to use as we move on throughout the semester. And so as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email up on Piazza, ask your fellow classmates, see if they have some answers for you. And I will see you next time.